Well, the people have spoken. Seven Deadly Sins has won the poll. Sorry, Ichigo, I'll get to you when I find an artist, because boy, do I have ideas. <laughs> Before we begin, I have two things to say. One, I still like this series for what it is because, uh, let's face it, no good manga series or anime adaptation has been perfect. Despite how popular some can be, there's usually some tendencies that come up that just really, really makes the fans angry. And this series is sadly no exception. Another fact, uh, this is actually going to be a two-parter video. The video turned out to be much, much longer, and uh, with you guys, I don't think a 30-minute video would capture your attention spans that much. I'm sorry, but it might be true. So for this one, it's going to be a two-parter. The first five, which are going to be, you know, understandable, but not changing the Seven Deadly Sins that much, and the good stuff is going to be waiting on in part two. But for each one, we're going to have some dishonorable mentions. Because 10 was not enough. Oh god, I hate myself for doing this. And this first dishonorable mention is going to be one that both the anime and the manga fans hate. But it's not something that Nakapa Suzuki decided for himself. This had other factors. And we'll get into it right now. Our first dishonorable mention is... Yeah, the, the animation from the last few seasons of the series. I mean, it's not Nakaba's fault. It's A1 Pictures. It is their fault. For those unaware, Seven Deadly Sins was originally done by A1 Pictures. You know, the guys who do Sword Art Online. The animation was great, it was fantastic even. This is why the first two seasons of the anime are considered the best. Because once this movie came out and it did not meet the numbers that the studio was hoping for, and because A1 Picture had to pick out which studio to drop, because, you know, budgeting, Seven Deadly Sins, it unfortunately got the short end of the stick and was kicked off because, hey, the movie was clearly a good excuse. But hey, go back to making more Kirito, cause why not? The production rights soon went to Studio Dean, that studio that made Konosuba. I think I'm pronouncing that name right, am I? Leave me know in the comments. Anyway, when this studio picked it up, they had less than one year to get the season animated, and they tried. Badly. Very, very, very badly. The animation looks unfinished, there's barely any shading, and the censorship! It is terrible! At least with A1, they went all out with the blood and gore and just not leaving out any details. But this one, oh my god, what were they thinking? White blood? Black fog? What? D no! Just freaking no! Big bucket of no. I mean, God, Dean, this is why people, specifically the fans, do not trust you anymore. I count this as a dishonorable mention because it's not a choice that Nakaba Suzuki made himself for the story, but rather it's just something that the studio did in such a short amount of time. On the small plus side, it got a lot of anime-only fans to switch over to the manga to see how Escanor vs. Meliodas should have gone. When Fan animations are doing better than the studio, you know you messed up. With that tangent out of the way, let's finally get into the numbers. Starting off with number 10. <laughs> yeah, this wasn't exactly Meliodas' best trait. I, no joke, told my friend the story of Meliodas, and my friend, who had only seen Seven Deadly Sins through, like, Season 1 clips, said this. I thought he was just a perverted little boy. He's really a demon king that lived over 3,000 years and his girlfriend has been reincarnating over and over and dying over and over again? Seriously. Well, I went around that, but you get the gist. Every time I look back at Meliodas just being a complete perv, I'm getting a mix of Sanji and Mineta vibes, it's not great. On the plus side, unlike those other guys, Meliodas is only pervy for one girl, and that is Elizabeth, even though other women have been throwing themselves at him, and yet he is still loyal. Now that's dedication, 
but it's not the strongest suit. I don't even know why he does it. Is it just something that he did with the original Elizabeth and he's just like trying to quote unquote jog their memories? He's certainly doing it in the wrong way. To put it shortly, dial the perviness down from 11 to let's say three. And it being very rare and just like boyfriend, girlfriend joke material, not I need a restraining order level. Which then brings us to number nine. Despite this being an action shonen, it is a little bit more on the romantic side. Most characters in the series have romantic interests and romantic side stories. Eh, for most people. Sorry, Eskinor. Meliodas and Elizabeth are basically Romeo and Juliet taken to the extreme. Deanne and King's relationship is based on memory of the heart rather than memory of the mind. Bond and Elaine is about a thief trying to steal back from death. Gelda and Zeldris is a prince and a lowly, facile peasant in the eyes of the Demon King, trying to keep their romance a secret. Gilthunder and Margaret, the noble princess, and the holy knights meant to serve and protect. There's a lot of different plot points with these romances. Even though uh, Gothers was very, very disturbed, he was not right in the head at the time. And this is one of the big weaknesses of why it's mostly a battle shonen, which is the romance is dialed down to a three, then it should have been up to like a maybe a five, four and a half maybe, because despite all the clear evidence that these two couples, or rather most couples, do love each other and their spouses, it doesn't get much development. Like, how did Meliodas and Elizabeth really meet, and how did their relationship even, like, start. They were both on opposing sides. I mean, Meliodas butchered all sorts of goddesses. There's a deep prejudice with the goddess clan against the demons. There must have been some very awkward first dates. And how did Zeldris and Gelda first fall in love? Please let it be better than Twilight. Please let it be better than that. But you get the gist. I think the romance could have been have a little bit more focus and maybe also do more. Like, each couple has like battle moments where they completely trust each other, you know, like most partners do. They trust what the other one is going to do. We could have gotten more of it, but eh, that's why it's just so low. It's a little nitpick, but something that just happened, okay? <sighs> Am I a bad girl? Deanne. Queen of the Giants, said to be one of the great giant warriors attested by Matrona herself. Yet to the community, she's just, um, not really taken that seriously. When the first season was all about fighting humans, being a giant clearly had its advantages. All you gotta do is just make sure you find the enemy and then bam, Deanne just stepped on him like bugs. Actually, I think she did with one. She lived, but who knows if well. Armed with her sacred treasure, Gideon, she could make the earth rumble and shake before her like a goddess of earth itself, a Gaia. However, there is a little bit of a trend going on with fairy kings and giants. Whenever we saw a fairy king, they're usually accompanied by a majestic, if not superior, giant. Troll was considered a god. The giant Dubs, despite his size, was able to make masterful weaponry, even including the sacred treasures that the Seven Deadly Sins use. Deanne is somewhat of a combo of the first two. From Droll, she learned how to do, I'd just call it a temporary boost dance. By dancing and connecting herself to the earth, drawing upon its power, she could boost her combat class and thus her great strength, making all sorts of creations, attacks, just increased dramatically. From Droll, her sacred treasure Gideon, which helps immensely. However, I do wish that Deanne was able to be a prodigy of her own through a different means. Matrona, who was considered one of the great chiefs of the giant clan, did build up Deanne to be extraordinary. Maybe Deanne could have unlocked like a new form of the giant clan magic creation. I mean, Droll did. Although, for this one, I would have considered just adding in a new element. And that element is lava. It's hot, it's brutal, and it's all kinds of deadly. This is another variant of 
earth magic and it could fit well with the giant clan. Even her sacred treasure Gideon could help chunk hot chunks of lava at enemies. Or pound it into the ground and create volcanoes. How crazy would that have been? As Deanne kind of stands now, she's not that different from a normal giant. But hey, I still love her. Wait, another girl in need of change? How dare you? Are you sexist, sir? No, no, look, I love Elizabeth and do think that for the most part, she does kind of have an, a great improvement. It's just that, well, this is the daughter of the Supreme Deity, a being who is said to be as strong, if not greater than the four archangels. She has the epithet, blood stained Ellie. And yet she is just mostly a healer and she's not really much of a fighter. How does she get that nickname if she's too afraid to fight? There's nothing wrong with being a healer. After all, a healer is just as important as the leader. They keep the members from dying, after all, and to continue the fight. However, I do think that Elizabeth should have had more chances to shine with her arc powers. Who knows what we could have saw from it. I mean, she made a giant freaking whale. A whale! And this was practically her holding back. Elizabeth, what the heck? You were kicking the Demon King's ass. Ah, uh, this is... Uh, all right, look, I still love Elizabeth. I think she was still okay, but she could have just done more in battles and could have just toughened up. I mean, Melios is still a little bit of a jokester, and yet when he gets serious, people get scared. So imagine if Elizabeth got serious and, you know, that'd be all sorts of conflicting. Sweet little Elizabeth turning into just a savage? Now that's terrifying. Maybe there's a reason why Tristan fears his mother. Okay, I do love the commandments. However, when doing the post on Reddit, there were some comments saying that the commandments could have been better. And I don't blame them. Practically half of all of the commandments were wiped out in season two. And some of their powers were a little um, lackluster to say the least. Grey Road is a curse maker, can shape shift, can make all sorts of minor demons through like these weird egg things. This girl thing, them, I don't know how to genderize it is crazy, yet was taken out pretty easily by Merlin. Fraudrin? Looks like a normal giant, but can grow so much bigger than a normal giant. Possibly to the size of a mountain. He went out like a bitch. Belascula and Gallon. I do love these two as a duo because this is like grandpa hanging out with his granddaughter, having good old times. It's fun, it's cute. However, they are not really the strongest duo either. Velascula's magic just mainly involves making portals. She's only scary when she's in her snake form. The only other thing she had going were her cocoon, which was recommended to be as difficult as an entire castle. That is to say, impossible to break down by oneself, unless you're Meliodas. And the other threat was her commandment, which if you lost faith in anything, you just lose your eyes. Gallon was an old man who could buff up just like the others. And that's about it. And if he lied, he turned to stone. Wow, Pinocchio, your your whole truth thing is actually starting to look better. Imagine if Pinocchio lied, he could have just went from puppet to a statue. There's also the original Gother, who was a great character, but he wasn't the most loyal. So I don't even know why the Demon King even bothered, because he just locked him up in a prison before he taught Merlin, seriously? But, but how, how? How did that happen? You know what? I'm not going to ask. Droll and Gloxinia are also commandments, even though their allegiances still lied with their original clan. So here's my issue with that. When going up against Meliodas, even though it's, it's Meliodas, so I didn't know what to expect, they could have had a lot more going on. These two were highly worshipped among their clans, and yet they seem so pitiful for the most part and they still managed to turn their backs? So for my change on this subject, I would have say make 
other members of the Ten Commandments to be way stronger than they originally were, and maybe create more sense of loyalty, because they are supposed to be brothers in arms. Derriere and Mon Speed just left. They took a couple of L's, and they left. Yeah, the Demon King's most elite warriors. 